Hello, and welcome to another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen Bookstore. Today, our very special guest author is Kristen. Did I get that right? Yes, and Brecker. Brecker, Kristen Brecker, whose new book is Photo Finished, a really wonderful launch to a new debut that I hope has a long run. Before we begin, I do want to let those listening in know that the Poison Pen does have copies of Photo Finished, and we would be happy to hold one for you or put one in the mail. Just give us a call or go online and we can connect you with this book. It's the perfect Christmas book for the cozy lover in your life. And I would like to welcome Kristen. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here today and chat with you, John. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm always fascinated, and I think a lot of readers are too, about how an author got to where they're at, but who they were before they were a writer, because sometimes that colors your writing process. And you have a fascinating origin story. Can you tell us a little bit about Kristen before she was a writer? Well, before I was a writer, I was actually, um, let's see, how far do we want to go back? <laughs> I'm well, we do have a bit of time. And then when I, no, um, uh, I think the origin story though for my writing um, started when I was living in London for a time with um, for my husband's job, and I had two little ones, and just this little bubble of time on my hands that usually you don't get in life. And I thought, well, what would be a mind-bendingly hard but fun challenge? Something that's portable. We were traveling a lot, something that's, you know, sort of cheap and easy. And I had fantasies of sort of like writing in a playground, which you can't do, but we start somewhere. And um, and I was nervous, of course. Um, and I went on this sort of like reading journey, which I've just started again, where um, the bookstores in London, they uh, Daunts and Waterstones, it's kind of like a, a labyrinth of book discovery versus, you know, sort of coming into your chain bookstores and sort of, you know, being led around the store. And so that was wonderful. And I started reading as if I were a writer. Um, that was just sort of my first put your toe in the water kind of thing. And then we weren't far from the Victoria and Albert Museum. And I don't know if they still do this, but back then they have a library there where you check everything but sort of a pen and and a pad and you can work in this beautiful space. And I just felt like, wow, this is so special and so neat. So I spent years starting there um, writing a book that I loved, but that I um, also, you know, just stuck with for years because it was my my equivalent of of a master's I guess you know like a self-taught you know just kept writing and rewriting and you know deleting and just learning um from that and, and going to some writing um writers groups at the New York Society Library in um in New York and I should say I'm speaking to you this morning my uh from from New York City and um and finally, I got this book done, and I thought it was great. And I found an off uh, agent, and she thought it was great. And then we never sold it. <laughs> um, and a year later, she came to me and said, "Would you be interested?" And of course, before she even finished the sentence, I said yes. <laughs> and um, she said, "You know, let me tell you about cozy mysteries because my other book had been a mystery, and you had elements of that in in your book." And um, you know, what do you think about this? And I thought this is made, these are made for me. And I had read, um, co coincidentally, some Reese Bowen, um, books where, you know, she was just the ultimate to me, uh, cozy mystery, uh, current cozy mystery author. And, you know, I, they, they spoke to me. Um, and, uh, I just thought that would be a wonderful opportunity to sort of write in that genre. Um, but mostly I knew how to, having been in marketing, put together a proposal. And um, so my agent said, come up with an idea um, and, you know, write an RF, think of it as an RFP, a request for proposal. Um, and I um, came up with an idea for a candle maker who lives on the island of Nantucket, who owns a store um, in town called the Wiccan Flame. And it just seemed to me that the Nant the island of Nantucket, which is off the coast of Massachusetts, was the most cozy uh, community that you could want to walk in, step into, and, and also escape to. Um, it was super fun writing about, you know, summer in Nantucket. Um, 
during, uh, you know, February. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, the island has this wonderful history that has to do with whaling and oils that were turned into the brightest and whitest and longest lasting can burning candles in the world for a time. So it was just like a perfect match. And, um, and the rest, you know, and then we just started. And uh, Photo Finish is going to be the second series that um, that I've written. Um, so your first published book was Murders No Vote of Cop yes. Confidence. And that yes. was in Tuckett series. It's a fascinating series because I hadn't really, I guess, made the connection between the whaling and the candle making in Nantucket. And what you also brought forward that um, is there, but again, I just took me a while to connect the dots was there's such strong women in Nantucket because the many of the men were away whaling so they were like in charge so I love that that you picked that up yeah <laughs> I think that cozy mystery um heroines are just the kind of people who are very brave and they jump into the unknown in order to sort of right the wrongs that maybe they see around them for um for justice for their communities for those they love and um, so those women were a great mirror of, you know, sort of what that spirit is. And so you um, had your first series. Now you've started your second, which just the book just came out photo finished. That's the first in the Liv Spires um, series. What can you tell us about Liv and this book without spoiling it for readers? Um, so it was super fun as a New Yorker to write a cozy mystery. That's a, first of all, a big challenge, right? Okay. To move from a little island like Nantucket into a big city like New York. Um, but uh, Liv Spires is a photographer. Um, she's aspiring to be a, um, you know, very established portrait photographer in New York City. She thinks, I'm going to do this because I have an in. I have a leg up. My grandparents live in New York City. They have a brownstone in the West Village, which they bought a hundred thousand, you know, so long ago, decades ago, when New York City was um, cheap. Yeah. was cheap. <laughs> Actually, it was in the seventies when it was not only cheap but bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, so she has this this opportunity, and she takes advantage of it. She moves in and sets up a photography studio, um, but you know like any 20 something who moves to a city and starts their lives and is ready to make their dreams come true, it's not always as easy as you think it's going to be. Uh -huh. And it's not for Liv and she's really struggling and um, trying to make ends meet and, and make her, her dreams come true um, until she meets a woman named Regina Montague, who is the um, premier events photographer in New York City. And they click, they connect, and Liv gets her first big break. So she heads to um, a debutante ball, uh, one of high society's big events of the season. Um, it takes place uh, in between Thanksgiving, or right, actually the day before Thanksgiving. And um, that by the end of the night, she's like, I got this. I, I, I nailed it. I took great photos. I helped Regina with some small emergencies. I handled myself well with, with the you know, very illustrious um, guests at the party uh, until she walks out and stumbles over the body of a billionaire, uh, Charlie Archibald, um, who has been murdered. And quickly all eyes turn to Regina as the prime suspect. And Liv doesn't believe she did it. And um, I always think of like, uh, you know, a, a cozy sleuth as having to have a, a superpower. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, Liv, Liv has a superpower, which is that um, is her eyes and her camera. And she knows that she has seen things, even if she doesn't know what she was supposed to have been seeing. That if she works with um, her photos in tandem with the people who um, become her sub suspects, she knows she can piece together the real story of what happened. Um, and uh, I don't think that gives it away. <laughs> yeah. And that's terrific. Um, it's, um, the book is clever in so many ways that you really crafted it. And the first is by making Liv a photographer 
it took me a while to kind of think about it. And that really is brilliant because she is looking at these crime scenes different from the casual person that just happens to be sucked into a murder investigation. She's seeing things like crime scene photographers would see. This is yes. not fair. This is not um, part of the logical conclusion. So that gives her de a definite edge as an amateur sleuth. Um, you've also given her kind of a background with her grandparents' business in the locks. So she knows both the legal and illegal sides of getting into buildings, which makes her um, <laughs> an asset too. I mean, there's a lot of little things that you wove into the story. I think, you know, that really, that's going to make her a formidable sleuth in this, this, as the series progresses. Thanks. And she's fun. You yeah. know, she's she's kind of soft on the inside, but she's got a little tough uh, exterior to because she hustles and she's, you know, mm -hmm. uh, ambitious and, and she's young and she's just going for it. Um, so I, I had fun with sort of the, the two sides of her, you know, being tough and jumping into things and then um, just this warm, big hearted girl who's got this great family and go good friends that have gone back you know, for her entire life, that kind of thing. And you do show the human side of her because a lot of the critics of Cozy say they're just manufactured and there's no reality and they're um, just story tell, stories told to people who want a pattern. But there's things going on in her family that are very real to a lot of people, especially with like her grandfather and things oh, like that. Yeah. So that becomes a part of the story. Um, another thing that you really illustrate that I think doesn't come up often enough is people, at least people who read Cozy's and many critics who don't think Cozy's have to be set in a small town, that that's like de rigueur, if I said that correctly, but that's like the thing that has to be, and you've shown that, no, you can set it in a place like New York City, because New York City is made up of yes. little communities, so can exactly. you talk about the importance of setting? Exactly. I mean, New York City is just a network of small communities that are, you know, woven and knit together, um, you know, sometimes beautifully, sometimes in difficult ways. Um, and um, uh, but also cozy is, I think, also a state of mind uh, or, or a, a style in terms of, um, you know, she has her family, she, she has small community. And even the um, suspects she she investigates, you know, they're in their own little bubble of, of community. Mm -hmm. And um, I think what interests live is, you know, or, or the theme of like family in Liv's life, I had, I enjoyed sort of exploring what those families are like and what makes them tick. And um, so, uh, you know, in that regard, I used cozy um, and family, you know, to knit together. And then the other thing is going back to Liv's eyes. You know, when you go somewhere and it's just, everything is so new and it's just eye candy. Mm -hmm. And so the book is, is through Liv's eyes and she's in a town that she's dreamed of living in. And so we're seeing her New York um, and, um, and her her New York is is even though there's murder, mm -hmm. a little cozy. You know, I was able to just enjoy sort of the romance of of the city, um, that um, you know maybe isn't even so um, prevalent right now. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, having lived here my whole life, it was a bit of a love story um, to to my town. And speaking of romance, there's a little bit of romance for Liv in the book, too. Um, can you talk about her potentially um, romantic partner? So she does meet uh, a, a guy named Harry, uh, Harry Fellows. And um, I there is romance. And the thing that I, I really uh, wanted to do with those two characters is um, the chemistry between those two builds because they're helping each other figure out the mystery, a mystery in each of their lives. Mm -hmm. And so they immediately sort of become this team. Um, it was kind of an old fashioned, I don't know, maybe, you know, like Nick and, and Nora. Nick and Nora. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying it. So I didn't have to, because that feels like or a little pretentious, the... but you know, uh, those are the things that, that speak to me. And uh, you know, so, 
they have their their chemistry they you know are figuring each other out deciding what's going on with each other and um um i i love them i think they're just the adorable and actually the most exciting thing for me was when kirkus came out with their review they said um it has the meat cutest meat cute in new york city and um you know i really kind of think of this book as as a a romantic comedy mystery mm -hmm. kind of thing and um and i kind of kept that to myself and then when i saw that i thought okay you know those genre can can coexist right. um which was you know nice to see um because a lot of times you'll see a love interest but um it's down I wanted to sort favor. of put put it on its head a little bit um, well, no, you're right. There's also a tradition in the sh in the genre of those partners like Nick and Nora. And I was thinking of um, McMillan and Wife and all those mm -hmm. classic television shows where there's two male female partners working together to solve crimes. Um, what I also found intriguing about Harry was he's an insurance appraiser. That's his job, I believe. Mm -hmm. And you have a background in art history. Was that kind of an influencing factor? It is, and I have fun with it in the next book. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, he does. He has. Um, he is an art appraiser for an insurance company. He does. Um, you know, and we'll just sort of leave it at that for now. Um, but he has a lot of interesting things that come up related to um, to the art, and the art world is amazing and and has so many mysteries in and of itself. Um, so there's so much fun you know, to have with them. Hmm. Um, another thing that you, I always like learning things when I'm reading mysteries, even that's not the primary focus. And <laughs> it's, um, the book kind of is set around a debutante ball in New York City. And I guess you were inspired by an article you read. I had no idea they still did debutante balls. And I guess they that's do. because I don't follow society, but that's a thing, I guess. You know, um, I think they just had the um, had had the t at least two of them in New York City just happened, um, and I think there's another one coming up. But yeah, they they do. Um, I don't think obviously it's the sort of fanfare that uh, surrounded them, and I don't know what do you think the heyday was. I was going to um, guess like the '40s and the '50s. The '40s, yeah. <laughs> Um, and, um, you know, I did tons of research and already, you know, I could have told you that off the top of my head, like two months ago. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> it's happening. Um, but um, it was fun. I wanted to do sort of an elegant event that was not just like a benefit or I don't know, just something that was unique in and of itself. Um, and, um, and it was also, it kind of framed um, the book in, in some ways. Uh, and it, you know, the story begins um, Thanksgiving and ends at Christmas. So, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, a big, um, you know, party season, obviously in New York City. And uh, so she, uh, there's like a real uptown, downtown, and then the traditional upstairs, downstairs kind of um, dynamic going on. So she, and Liv ends up going to some uh, parties that she would never um, otherwise have, have attended while she's investigating the story. Um, Maria Ricci, who's her best friend from life in the beginning of the book, she's supposed to live is supposed to be going to her party, the wild turkey party, um, you know, where they're going to kick back and do shots of wild turkey to celebrate Thanksgiving. And then next thing you know, she's, you know, putting together her black tie outfit and dating a guy who wears a tuxedo like she wears pajamas, you know, so. Um, Let's talk a little bit about research because while many people think authors can just make things up, you do have to kind of know some facts um, about the frame for your different series, like candle making in the Nantucket books, photography in your new series. What kinds of research do you do? Is it hands-on? Do you do um, book research? Talk about that as an author. So I was a little more hands-on with the candle um, books in terms of learning the craft of candle making. Um, I, my daughter and I went to um, Brooklyn to Industry City one night 
um, for an amazing workshop. And um, I definitely, you know, tried my hand at candle making a lot at home and just feeling the wax. And also because that was an important aspect for, for that character. It helped me get to know her, just like feeling the wax and the heat and figuring out how to get a wick inside of a glass to stand straight and those sorts of things. Um, because in that series, a lot of her uh realizations come when she pulls herself out and she sort of gets in that creative zone which you know frees her mind um in the photography series um it it was a little strange because um we all take photos constantly on our phones all the time um and so it felt a little you know sort of i'm already doing it kind of thing um, you know, I went out with a better camera. I, I tried to, um, you know, I started personally seeing things a little differently as I started to think of her, like I was really drawn to graffiti for some reason. Now, Liv is really interested in, in portrait photography, um, but, you know, you start looking at your city a little differently because I was seeing it through her eyes. Um, and then I would add that I have a friend who is a professional photographer. And we spent loads of time talking about just the nuances of, you know, she would never say, she would never call it photo, her studio photos. I think originally I said lives by her photos and she was like, you would never say that, you know, oh. seems really obvious now that I mention it, but I was just in my, my little world. Um, and it was fun because she and I have been on these creative paths together forever. Um, but I was talking to her in, in her world and, and seeing her the way she looks at things. And um, so I learned a lot. And I think, you know, I understood my friend a little better too now. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's shift and talk a little bit about your writing process. Um, I know for mysteries, especially to me, at least, they're very structured because you have to know who the killer is, you have to know when to plant clues, but there are authors who kind of take a more free form approach. When you're writing your mysteries, what path do you take? Do you know in advance? Is it more of explore as you go? Well, um, you know, a cozy mystery in general does have certain elements that exist, as you mentioned, you know, this idea of a small town, but we're going to say for our purposes, you know, a cozy community. Mm -hmm. um, it, there's uh, not a lot of gore in terms when they find the, the dead body, um, you can have a love interest, but, you know, a lot of the heat, you know, is off, off screen. There's often a cat or a dog, a pet. Um, the protagonist is an amateur sleuth and she ha or he have, um, you know, a hobby, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, all to say that for me, it was great in some ways to have a map. I'm a big fan of the map. <laughs> um, that talked to like whatever that side of the brain is that also helped me write that proposal for the uh, candle making series. And then you're kind of free to be very creative within that. Mm -hmm. um, so those two things immediately sort of work in tandem for me as I, as I start each book. Um, and then um, I do have a vision complete vision of the story from start to finish um, before I sit down and write. Um, and I I have sort of um, an outline, but I've decided really to uh, recently to refer to them as like goalposts to hit along the way, because the details definitely find themselves in the writing. And as you get deeper into a character, there's opportunities that you have that you can mine that you didn't know before you started. Um, and so I wish I could have, you know, an outline that just is chapter one, two, three, four, five, five, five. Uh, and I know a lot of authors have that luxury um, to be able to do that. Um, I haven't been able to do that yet. But um, the other thing I did with the photography um, series is um, I made vision boards, um, the characters, a visual person. And so um, I, you know, had pictures of brownstones in the West Village. There's this well-known, actually, key store in the West Village um, that is decorated with keys all over the facade. So I had that, um, you know, sort of graffiti, city, the high, the low, all of those things kind of coming together 
think I found a picture of a girl like who fell out of a cab and this lines, you know, on her face. So, you know, just showing all of those, those different sides of her. And it actually, especially for starting a new series, really um, helped a lot. Um, you know, I drew the the brownstone. Um, I, I drew the um, floor plan for her apartment slash studio. It was like kind of a visual outline <laughs> for my visual character. Before you turned to writing as a career, you worked in television. Did that help shape you as a writer in any way? Did seeing things told from that storytelling viewpoint influence you? Can um, Yeah, I mean, I studied theater in college and then right out of college, I worked definitely in, in production at very low level. Um, and then um, I went into marketing mm -hmm. and sometime afterwards, and I worked at Time Incorporated um, for a long time. Um, and that career was focused on brand building. And um, to me, they're all about storytelling. You know, it's uh, putting together a story, a live story to in theater um, where every element kind of fits the same th theme so that a, a, a story, a visual story is tight. In marketing, it's, you know, creating um, a product or uh, and and explaining to your audience what the story is of that product and and why they may or may not want to you know consume it. Um, and so you know some people are like, how'd you go from corporate business to writing? And for me, it's um, you know that's the sort of thread that goes through through everything. Hmm. You mentioned brand. How would you, for someone who's never read your books, describe your own literary brand? What keywords would you use? Ooh, that's a great question. Well, both of my characters um, are, one thing they do share is they're very entrepreneurial. They're, they have a lot of um, gumption. Um, um, I, I think, okay, for everything I would say, there's humor. Mm -hmm. um, there's sort of a light touch with, um, you know, an interesting plot. Mm -hmm. um, I want to turn the question on you. <laughs> um, um, and, and, you know, uh, really spunky women who, who mm -hmm. have a lot of different skills that they manage to tie together. Yeah, I was going to say spunk as they quote Mary Tyler Moore, your heroines kind of have that characteristic. Um, I think one of the things that I've enjoyed about your mysteries is there's the comfort of familiarity in the genre, but you bring a freshness to it. So there's kind of that dual feature. You're reading something that you really love because we all love mysteries for many reasons, but one is because you get those returning um, sense of justice being restored and familiarity with that, but you also kind of make it fresh and new in a different way. And you do have kind of a bright voice with the humor included. I think you're very good at um, settings. You really have a, almost like, I guess you'd say an eye, photographer's eye. <laughs> Those art history classes all those years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, yeah, well, I know Nantucket and New York City so well, um, and uh, so they were they were love letters, I guess you could say, to both places. I think I said that before. Hmm. Let's um, take another turn and talk a little bit about um, Kristen as a reader. You mentioned, I think, before that when you were initially writing the Nantucket series, you had gone to bookstores and that was like a return to reading. Um, when you first started out, what kind of, I think, if I understand correctly, you were a mystery reader, you, Agatha Christie featured in your reading life. Talk to um, us. Well, uh, having grown up um, for a lot of my uh, time as a child in Nantucket, um, I think that's where my love of mystery began. Uh -huh. um, that island, especially way back, you know, when I was a kid, the fog, the sort of palpable sense of ghosts and mysteries and fog horns at night and fairy horns in the morning and um, dirt roads, which are now paved, but, you know, sort of the adventure of, of, dry, of riding over those. Um, was a great setting um, to sort of have 
an imagination in general and and one that would lean toward um mystery and then um there's a, a bookstore in Nantucket called Mitchell's and bookstore named Mitchell's bookstore and they used to have um in, right in the front to the right uh, a children's nook and mm -hmm. on the floor we would just my brother younger brother and I we would sit and they had every um Hardy Boys Nancy Drew um Bobsy twins if you remember them mm -hmm. um and so that was just you know a highlight of the day would be you know you get to go by yourself too when you're little because it was such a little town and go to this bookstore and go through all of those books we still have them all <laughs> <laughs> and um and then the Agatha Christie I think Agatha Christie for me started when I was about like 10 or 11 and we rented we always joke in my family um that we like rented every house on the island at some by by now <laughs> um and there was this one um that is across the street from a, a house that is noted to be haunted. Mm -hmm. And the um, owners had this huge library of Agatha Christie and P.G. Woodhouse. Yeah. And um, I just devoured all of them um, that summer. That was also the summer of Little Women. <laughs> <laughs> the first book I didn't ever want to end and cried when it ended. <laughs> um, so, um, and then my brother is um, also a mystery, um, he writes plays. Uh -huh. um, and so he is a huge mystery lover and has a mystery library in his like room in Nantucket, um, which was across, right across from my room. So, you know, I just would always go in there and it's the most well-edited mystery library. I discovered Rex Stout through his little bookshelves and I love Rex Stout. Um, and uh, so, you know, it kind of runs in the family. He wrote a play, it's uh, called A Sherlock Carol and it's a mashup between A Christmas Carol and A, a Sherlock Holmes story where Tiny Tim is now grown and, and Scrooge has passed away and they think he was murdered. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I guess we like think about murder a lot. <laughs> <laughs> really you know cozy family <laughs> um you have been writing now for a while as you look back if you could give yourself advice when you were first starting out what piece of advice would you give yourself as a writer um to me with writing to tell anybody it's don't feel like you are um a failure if you don't get published. Mm -hmm. I think the most wonderful thing about writing is you can define what your success will be. Um, you can write just for yourself and that could be a very satisfying experience. You can write just for the children in your lives or your relatives or your friends, um, or you can be published. And all of them I think are legitimate um, paths to enjoy and one thing I love about writing is you know I get to keep that even if I never have another published book um I can always just sit down and create a world and characters and a story and um and enjoy that um and I think that's just an important thing to keep in mind mm -hmm. and also when people criticize your work don't defend what you wrote listen to what they say because mm -hmm. um you ask them to read it you want to learn from them, you know. I think that's very smart. You can always listen to people. You don't have to accept what they're saying. Yeah. But you can and listen to them. And I think sometimes writers get very um, discouraged when they get criticism and they don't always realize that sometimes the critic is reacting to something because of what's going on in their life. So their criticism may not necessarily mm, be based on, on your book. So, I mean, definitely... It's yeah. It's scary though, you know, I remember the first time I, I had my work critiqued, it was down the street at the 92nd Y, Street Y, and uh, I took a, a class with a friend of mine, and um, I'd never, you know, sat around a table and had a group of people give me feedback, and I didn't expect this, but I kind of almost thought I was going to faint halfway through, mm. um, you know, <laughs> and now I'm just like, you know, can't get enough criticism. I'm always like, come on, you didn't really like it. What, what, what could I have done, you know? Um, so you become addicted to the criticism. 
I, yeah, I think you're right. It's difficult for some authors because writing is very personal and criticizing it can be perceived as an attack on the person and not just yeah, it's work. Not. And it's not, but um, in the end, yeah, it's, it's being a writer is tough. I don't know why anybody wants to be one, but yeah, you have all these <laughs> I don't know. things going on. Um, before we run out of time, can you tell us what's next for you? Can we help for another book soon? Yes, I am putting finishing touches on the next book in the um, snapshot of New York City's mysteries okay. um, in um, photo finished, Liv jumps into the world of high society. And in um, the next book, and I don't think I'm giving anything away because I just saw it's up on uh, Amazon presale, um, which I didn't realize, um, is Mugshots of Manhattan. Um, it's the best cover. I don't, even if you don't like my books, you got to look at the covers because Kensington did such a fabulous job. And um, in, uh, in this book, Liv is thrown into the world of celebrity and uh is is sort of making her her way through um this other new world for herself so it's the paparazzi or whatever paparazzi um i like this idea of um you know what would um what is privacy um mm -hmm. these days and um you know how to photograph something personal versus um the paparazzi um it made me think a little bit uh, as an inspiration when I was starting of the, uh, um, I know there's so many versions of this, but I specifically the uh, old movie High Society, um, the musical version with uh, Grace Kelly, um, where, you know, that idea of media invading what is your personal time and your personal space. Um, I thought was sort of like an interesting thing to think about in in our generation, um, in our in this current day. So um, I, it's it's fun. It's different. It's still in New York, and it's still just a lot of the same characters. But um, I, I realized when I was finishing it, like just the, it, it's it has a very different tone. Uh, not tone, no. Uh, it's a definite, definitely different journey, and she's in different parts of New York City, which I also really like. Uh, there's so much still to explore. You've got a lot of material to work with. Yeah. Um, how can readers learn more about you and your books? Are you on social media? What? I am. Um, yeah. So, by the way, I just recently joined Book Talk, TikTok, but Book Talk. I guess book it's talk. Book Talk. Once you start, you know, the algorithm starts to figure out what you want, and then you're suddenly mysteriously in Book Talk. Um, and I, I went on because my my agent and my editor were like, "You have to." this is what people do. And I went on and every book is spicy. And I thought, no, I'm sitting here holding up a candle book. <laughs> I cannot, I cannot compete with Colleen Hoover. Yeah. But, um, but number one, it's a really, I encourage people not to be intimidated because I actually have gotten a lot of great book um, uh, suggestions out of it. I just finished Song of Achilles, which I, for some reason hadn't read. And, uh, you know, it kept popping up on every, um, feed. Um, so I'm on there at Kristen Brecker Books. Um, and uh, I'm on Facebook, uh, Kristen Brecker Books, and um, Instagram, Kristen Brecker Books. And then my website is kristenbrecker.com. That's great. I'll have to look yeah. on Book Talk for you. That's a whole new world. Out. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I can't believe how quickly our time has flown by. The Poison Pen has just been so... Um, uh, delighted to have Kristen Brecker and her new book, Photo Finished, as our special guest author today. I would encourage all those listening in to give it a try. It's a terrific debut. I can't wait for the next in the series. And I want to thank Kristen for taking time to visit with us virtually. And thank you so much for having me. I'm a big fan of Poison Pen, so this means a lot to have been able to talk to you today. Thanks. Oh, well, thank you. And thank you for tuning in to another virtual author chat at the Poison Pen. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.